So, hello everyone. Um, we're happy. Um, it's my honor to be here. Um, my name is Jesse Yu. I'm a um, clinical pharmacologist uh, in Rose Genentech. Uh, working with uh, Trinity. So currently, I'm a um, global clinical lead for a uh, drug candidate in the breast cancer. So I will just follow uh, with uh, Trinity's talk where Trinity was focused on the first in human development and as, as well as the general clinical pharmacology understanding. And then I will talk a little bit more about some of the dedicated uh, clinical pharmacology study that we may conduct uh, during, through the drug development. So as you can see uh, in the in this slide, so right, we character we obtain the clinical pharmacology knowledge either through the uh, phase one, phase two, phase three studies, and sometimes we also conduct uh, dedicated clin clinical pharmacology studies as a, a complement uh, to uh, to inform or, or to understand the clinical attributes of the drug candidates. And uh, and uh, <clears throat> one major reason for us to do those uh, to conduct those clinical characterization is to uh, inform the drug label. Uh, so here on the on the right, I have this uh, FDA drug label template, and uh, you can see some of the key information such as the total, the dose and administration, uh, drug interaction, special population, uh, and the dedicated clinical uh, clinical pharmacology section. Those are all uh, informed by our so our uh, the confined knowledge obtained through the either uh, phase one to phase three study or the dedicated confar study or analysis. And uh, as Trinity mentioned, uh, we if, um, sometimes we conduct the experimental confar analysis, and sometimes we use the modeling. And uh, one of the key deliverable to confirm is also to understand the variability we observe in the clinical trial. So then the key question would be what are the uh, clinically relevant uh, in intrinsic or ex uh, extrinsic factor that may impact the drug exposure. So by conducting the dedicated clinical study, so we may have understanding of the ADME of the drug in humans or and as well as you know the impact of the intrinsic factors such as organ function, as well as as, a, as well as the extrinsic factors such as the the food, the formulation, um, like how those factors may impact uh, the drug exposure. It's not boom. Okay, so. And because the dedicated clinical uh, uh, study was originally triggered by the small molecular development, so in this talk I will focus a little more about the um, a small molecular clinical trial st study. So first I will focus on the drug absorption and uh, uh, bioavailability. So you may have heard about the term, different term related to the bioavailability. So there's a bioavailability, absolute bioavailability, and the relative bioavailability. And sometimes you also heard the term called the bioequivalent. So the, the, the bioavailability pretty much is just an uh, estimate of a fraction of the drug um, being available through the system uh, circulation after the oral or after a, 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 a single administration. So, and the absolute viability is specifically related to the um, uh, viability through either oral or um, sub-Q versus the IV. So there's a specific calculation equation I'm listing here. And then the relative viability really is comparing to uh, is try to understand the impact of the formulation of the food, and how is that um, how 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 it will be the exposure after the change of formulation of food uh, compared to the reference um, uh, formulation or you know dosing without the food, and then when we talk about the by equivalence and really this is the turn after we perform uh, really the by equivalence study, so we can say there's no statistically. Uh, difference on the exposure between the two between the testing um, formulation and the and the reference formulations. So you may ask, so why do we need to uh, conduct the uh, food uh, effect or by relative uh, or biobiology studies through the drug development? And this is because the, you know dosing with or without the food or change the formulation can either increase or decrease the drug exposure. 
and such impact may have a uh, um, may impact the efficacy and the safety of the drug. But sometimes they may numerically increase the uh, concentration or decrease the concentration, but there's no clinical uh, relevant impact. And this is really um, will be determined on the based on the therapeutic window, um, such as the exposure response the profile of your drug candidate. So we want to conduct a study and uh, understand whether you know, the change of formulation or dosing ways, whether we need to do a dose ad adjustment due to change of formulation or uh, dosing ways of food. So first I will focus on the food effect study. And uh, we may need to conduct the food effect study through the various stage of the drug development. So typically we want to do a pilot of food effect studies just to have an early understanding of you know, whether dosing with food may significantly change the exposure or not. And the reason to do this study early is to inform uh, our clinical protocol, right? How we ask, do we want to dose with the food or without the food in our phase one, phase two study, etc. And also based on the regulatory requirement, typically they will require you to conduct a pivotal food effect study uh, use, using the to be market formulation. So, so you want to do a um, dedicated food effect study uh, with your commercial uh, formulation. And uh, and really the full effect study is to evaluate the exposure change between dosing fasted, which means that a patient takes the drug without uh, having food for you know eight to ten hours versus uh, dosing with the food and and the, and the here the food treatment typically we, we study a uh, uh, high fat meal uh, which is you know high calorie and uh, high fat content and uh, I think FDA provides some very specific uh, example of what that high fat meal may be. And the, re the reason to do that is to characterize the potential worst case scenario. Um, and the, we could also, if we think, you know, there may be a difference between high fat and low fat meal versus the fasted. So we can also conduct more than uh, one type. Uh, we can conduct study with more than one type of the uh, meal. And the really here to do, we want to use the study information to, to guide you know, the clinical protocol, whether the drug can be administrated with or without food and in, and also using the pivotal food effect study to inform our drug label. Um, similarly, I think for the um, bioavailability study, because, you know, through the drug development stage, um, I think very likely we may be need to change the formulation due to uh, various reasons, whether it's a manufacturer or CMC and other uh, reasons. So um, sometimes when we are not sure whether the change of the formulation may have a, a clinically relevant impact on the drug exposure, and this is where uh, we may conduct a relative availability study. And the, and the goal of the study really is to evaluate the, the exposure of the testing uh, formulation versus the reference for, uh, formulation. So both full effect and the RBA study are typically we, we do it with a single dose design, a single dose crossover. If you know if if the drug candidate has a linear PK and the time independent PK, so. And uh, for the bioability study, really, we want to just evaluate the exposure of the testing formulation versus the reference, then we can make a judgment call see whether we need to uh, have a dose adjustment within the testing formulation um, or not. And then I think in this slide here, I'm just showing um, uh, different uh, option for design. So on the left, this is a very standard uh, two treatment effect, uh, RBA, uh, design so this is like a two treatment uh, two peer uh, crossover um, design and sometimes we would combine the food effects study with the RBA study so we want to understand both the relative availability as well as the food effect uh, with the new formulations and so on the right I'm showing here this will be the in this case you know we will do uh, the three treatment three peer uh, crossover design. And then um, sometimes we would uh, need to do BE study uh, rather than the relatively uh, relative bioavailability study. And you may uh, uh, want to uh, understand like why and what scenario we, we may be required to do a BE study. Because really BE study is a more stringent version 
at least to, in my opinion, is like a more stringent version of the RPA study, uh, which require a uh, very formal statistic uh, powering and the uh, statistic testing of the bi-equivalent result. And the goal here is to meet this BE criteria bar, which is showing that the 90% uh, confidence interval of the new exposure ratio are uh, within the 80 and the 125 um, criteria as defined by the uh, regulatory agents. So uh, maybe there are two major scenarios that we need to do the BE study. So first is that there is a major formulation difference between the clinical formulation and the to be marketed uh, formulation. So here, the clinical for formulation is referred to the form formulation that you used in your pivotal studies. So that could be the phase three studies or you know pivotal study that informed to the drug filing. And uh, for whatever reason, um, unfortunately, there is a major formulation change between the formulation you use in your clinical study and the formulation you actually want to uh, launch uh, for the uh, the, the, for the commercial you want to uh, distribute after approval, then you may be required to do a B study um, to do the formulation uh, bridging. So in this case, the only uh, relative R, R, uh, bioavailability study may not be sufficient. Uh, and, uh, and then another scenario is that after your drug is approved, and for whatever reason, you want to launch a new formulations, and uh, typically, you also need, uh, would be re expect to conduct a BE study to demonstrate the bioequivalence between the two formulations. Um, and sometimes, unfortunately, you know, we may, you know, de depend on drug uh, uh, PK property and the formulation. Unfortunately, we may fail to be criteria. And that's not necessarily the end award. And uh, we could also evaluate whether the observed difference in the BE study, whether that's a clinically uh, relevant or not. And in this case, you make that uh, judgment call based on the ER profile of your drug and then have a conversation uh, with the regulatory agents uh, discussing the next steps. So this is about uh, uh, the clinical study related to absorption and uh, bioavailability. And, and also, I think, as previous speaker mentioned, now we have where you try to use as more and more modeling tool to support our clinical characterization, in particular for the viability and absorption. Um, now the industry have to use the PPK modeling uh, to to access the the the, the risk of uh, you know thing the B and how to and also the risk of the the in, the, the impact of the on the exposure uh, due to the formulation change. So the PVK model is becoming a more and more important tool to help us to, to make an assessment of the relative bioavailability, BE, and uh, uh, the impact of the drug and the full effect on the drug exposure. Then next, I will um, just move, just talk a little bit more about the, the King Fast study related to the drug um, metabolism and uh, uh, eliminations. So one of the important study uh, in the drug development is, is the human um, ADME, also called the human mass balance study. So what this study does is that typically you administer a radio label the drug, typically it's a single dose in the house volunteer. Then you measure the excretion of the radioactive activity in plasma, uh, feces, and the uh, urine. And you may wonder why we need to do this study. So typically, um, we want to conduct this study before initiate the uh, um, pivotal studies, initiate, like, for example, the, the phase three study. And so the reason we do this study is that it can really help us to understand the drug metabolism and the excretion pathways um, in human, because we're measuring the radio uh, activities in, in, you know, in the urine phases, and that's really Helpful and also the radio label activity help us to identify any um, circulating metabolites in humans, and the, the those med ID informations can inform us like whether we need to do certain uh, DDI or toxicology studies for the human metabolites. So in this slide, I'm just showing an example. Uh, on, I think on the on the left, uh, you can see that we're 
in the mass balance study, people would follow the radioactivity uh, in the urine phases as well as in plasmas, and, and also um, the scientists would also conduct a metabolism identifications in, in parallels. And those informations um, and are really useful for us to inform us the special population stu uh, study and to determine what uh, special population is designed and, uh, and also the certain DDI and the toxicology characterization for the metabolites. Draft guidance for the human mass balance study, so I'm just touching on the on the right. Mm -hmm.